All right, we should be getting set up here. Okay, now it's back. Now it's back up. Seeing now streaming live on Facebook. Okay. Okay. Not seeing it on the Facebook page, but All right, Joe, we are uh, we're live here on the Facebook feed. Okay. So uh, thanks everyone for tuning in. I wanna welcome all of our friends of the Dillon Ranger Districts. We are, uh, we're sad that we can't be doing this in person, but very happy that we're still able to reach some people through the interweb. Um, this is our first of our educational webinar series. We're here with Joe Newhart. He's our resident geologist. He's been helping us out for many, many years here. Usually does an auto tour all around the county, speaking to the uh, geologic history of our county. Um, and we are not in our cars today. We have to be behind screens, but uh, hopefully this will change soon. And uh, again, I just wanna thank everyone for tuning in. Um, I really wanna thank, you know, just the volunteers and everyone who who tunes into this and comes to our our educational hikes and these webinars you know the uh you guys are the backbone of our of our uh community and the backbone of what makes fdrd so great uh, i think i speak for all of the staff in saying that we really miss you guys and are excited to uh to hopefully see you in person later on this summer um i forgot to introduce myself i'm cameron breen i am the uh, education and Youth Programs Manager with FDRD. Um, but with that, I'll hand it over to Joe and he will get started with uh, with his presentation. Okay, thanks, Cam. Yeah, sorry we couldn't do this out in person and be out looking at the rocks and outcrop, but uh, I've got some photographs and some other slides here that I've taken from the posters I use on the when we do get out in the field. And we're gonna go through the first part of the geologic history at Summit County. Like I says, the first one and a half billion years. And then, um, Maybe later on this summer, we can kind of cover the rest of the time, uh, time frame, uh, last uh, 250 million years or so uh, with the rock record is present in, uh, in the county. So what we'll do is I'll go ahead and go to the PowerPoint. And um, put a slideshow in the beginning. Okay. So anyhow, we're going to go through the first billion and a half years of, of, of the history of Summit County. Um, and this really starts about somewhere between 1.8 and 2 billion years ago as far as Summit County is concerned. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to make it kind of a virtual field trip today with three stops in the Summit Eagle County area. The first stop we're going to go to would be where we normally, our first stop when we go out in the field is in the 10 Mile Canyon off I-70. I at the Officer's Gulch exit, which is exit 198. And if you if you go want to go look at the rocks, go, go ahead and get off of that exit, turn right, and then get on the old road that parallels, the old highway six that parallels I-70. Go down to the, the end, there's a turnaround, come back and park, and then you can, you're right there, the outcrops right along there. And the second stuff will be, we're going to go talk, we'll call, talk about the rocks you see if you're, if you're driving between Minturn and Red Cliff on US Highway 24 near the ghost town of Gilman. And then our third virtual stop will be in the Vail Pass, Shrine Pass area. And um, so we'll be talking about all, all the rocks we see in these places. Okay, so stop one are these, what we call a Proterozoic, which are rocks that were uh, aged about um, 1.8 billion years old. He's been radiometric age dated by the United States Geological Survey right in this area. And these rocks are metamorphic rocks, which means they originally were something else. And they originally were uh, sedimentary rocks that were deposited. Um, and then they were 
heated and partially melted and turned into these coarse grain metamorphic rocks we call gneisses. And these rocks form the core of the 10 mile range, the Gore range, and they sit on top of the Williams Fork range. So if these started out as sedimentary rocks, how did they become metamorphic rocks and how did they get here? So we'll talk about that. Um, so here's a geologic map of the Gore range. Uh, down at the bottom, you can see where the, where the highway makes that turn and heads, uh, you know, it comes south through the 10 mile canyon, and then it turns west right at Copper Mountain. So the Officer's Gulch area is the area where we have that, there's that pond, and the, that's the, this map was, was uh, constructed in the early 1960s before Interstate 70 was, was, was in place. So the road here, that's old Highway 6. So the outcrop we just show is right in this area where these kind of these purple and green banded rocks are. So these are these gneisses. These are the gneisses down here also, as you keep continuing on around in, uh, towards Wheeler Flats and towards Copper Mountain. All the pink rocks are granites, and they're about the same age. So we'll, let's go ahead and then we'll talk about how these, how these rocks formed and how they got to where they're at. So anyhow, about um, 1.9 to 2 billion years ago, there was a, a volcanic island arc depicted here in this little cross section, this schematic cross section, offshore this continental block. This continental block is what we call, is up in Wyoming. So it'd be kind of like you'd be looking from north to south in today's, today's plane. So anyhow, you had a volcanic island arc would be very similar to what we would see is Japan or the Philippines or the Indonesian archipelago, Java, Sumatra, that area. And so you have, a, you know, the volcanoes would be, you know, erupting from time to time, spewing out lava flows and ashes. And then also in the, in the um, basin in between the island arc and the continent, you have sediments being deposited. So we've got volcanic ash, and ash beds and also some sedimentary rocks, sands and muds. And um, this island arc slowly approaches this, this continental mass because this piece of oceanic crust is being subducted beneath this island arc. So if we look at the next, next slide, it's about 1.8 billion years ago, this island arc is starting to get very close to this continental mass and the sediments are starting to get squeezed and, and moved around. And the sediments are, the island arc is almost getting ready to collide with the continental block. So then we get this collisional event. So the, this, this was what was the volcanic island arc to be granites and lavas, um, you know, basalts and ash, ash beds. And here's all these sediments that were all crunched up and, the, and some of the continental crust is, has, been, has been sheared and thrusted back up on, on itself. So anyhow, this, this event was called the Yavapai orogeny. These rocks are part, called the Yavapai terrain. Um, and these, when you get these sediments down below probably 30 to 40,000 feet in depth, you, you got into an area that we call the brittle ductile transition zone. These things are heated up, they're under high pressure, and they become partially melted and become meta metamorphic rocks. And then subsequent erosion down to this level has exposed these in the in the roots of, the, of our Rocky Mountain uplift. So the gneisses here in the Gore Range, right at Officer's Gulch, have been dated 1.758 to 1.693 billion years ago, or 1758 million years ago. And the granite the, um, in the Gore Range called the Cross Creek granite, and it was has been dated at uh, 1700 million years uh, ago. You don't see it well exposed from the highway anywhere around the, the uh, Officer's Gulch, Copper Mountain area. If you go over to um, the um, Willow Creek Trailhead and Willow Creek Subdivision and take the hike up towards South Willow Falls, the first big chunks of rock you see sitting along the trail are big blocks of granite that have been carried down from the, from, from the, the higher mountain. 
these rock sizes, as I said earlier, form the core of the uh, of the mountain ranges, and we basically these are the these are the rocks that are that form the uh, continental crust that uh, is under Colorado. The the original block of this other continental block is up in Wyoming. All of this stuff is now Colorado. So this this is a Yavapai orogeny, 1.7 to 1.8 billion years ago, getting a little bit younger to maybe 1.6. Um, and then there was another island arc event. So, but we'll we'll talk about that next. So anyhow, but take a look at a modern analog to the Yavapai orogeny. And here is a map of Australia. Now Australia, look, note that north is pointing down, not up. This is Australia. This is the, the volcanic islands of the band, what we call the Banda Arc. And that would be an, analogous to what was happening 1.7, 1.8 billion years ago, where you get this Wyoming block, you got these island arcs offshore, and they're colliding in with um, and, and, and accreting or gluing themselves onto the edge of the growing continental mass. And then so- Hey, Joe, we, uh, we had a quick question. Okay. He was asking if the volcanic arc shut off after the collision. Yes, it does. Yeah. It, it, it shuts itself off because the, it, it's, it's basically glued itself onto the continental mass. But if you look at this, we can go, go ahead and explain it here. Here is, you can see North America outline uh, with United States and Canada. And then back about this point in time, these continental masses, like this is Australia, Antarctica, the Baltic region, um, Southwest and East, Eastern Asia, all came together and formed this supercontinent called Rodinia, which is Russian for motherland. So anyhow, this Yavapai group that we were talking about, this is the stuff that accreted along about 1.8 uh, to 1.6 million. Uh, billion years ago. And then outboard of that is this green stuff was called the Mazatlan terrain. And it came in a little bit younger. Um, and then another, these are all island arc complexes that, that just, you know, we call this arc continent collisions. And then around 1.3 to 1 1.5, you know, this time for about 1.4 billion years ago, another group accreted to the edge of the continent. And there was enough force with this collisional event that inboard in what in what we see as Colorado today, there was some shear zone set up. So there was some there was some shearing of the continent, and there were some granites that were in place that were about 1.4 billion years uh, in age. And we see them in Summit County, right at the edge of Summit County. We see them up by the Eisenhower Tunnel. We see them on Tenderfoot Mountain, and um, um, we see them uh, over around Silver Plume, and it's been dated at 1.4 billion years ago. So I think about about a billion by by about a billion years ago, all these continental masses had had, had you know glued themselves together into a supercontinent. And these supercontinents, when they form, they're not very stable because you've got um, you know big convection cells in the in the mantle underneath the crust, and as soon as one of these things forms. These, these convection cells underneath it are trying to rip it apart, so that they're fairly short-lived in geologic time. <laughs> so anyhow, if you look at this area right in here, this is the area that's going to that's going to break apart, and Australia, Siberia, Antarctica are going to are going to rift away, and um, we'll we'll see that here in this, this next slide. So anyhow, about 750, 700 million years ago, the West those those other continental masses rifted away, and then you ended up with a edge of the craton or, or continental mass. Oops, let me go back one. Uh, I gotta go back. How do I go back? Previous. Okay. So anyhow, <clears throat> they 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 ripped it apart. The sweet sea floor spreading like we see in the Atlantic Ocean today, where you have a mid mid, mid ocean ridge. Where, where volcanic materials coming up, forming new oceanic crust that's pushing the continents apart. So when these rifts start, they start kind of as uh, you know you're looking on a sphere. So you get a heat a heating event, uh, you know, some magmas coming up, and when they start to break, 
they break in kind of like 120 degree angles. And so what we call a failed arm of the rift is one of these 120 degree arms doesn't continue that the other rifting events do and, and set up the continental margin. So we get a failed arm, it's called, a, we term it lockagen, and it's filled with sediment. This one is in the Uinta mountain region, it's filled with sediments. And these are sediments that are about this 700 million year old range. And that set up the, uh, you know, that was preserved in this allocogen. And then they were inverted later and became the Uinta Mountain. But this rifting event set up the Paleozoic um, continental margin in North, of North America. So this is, that takes us from about 1.8 up to about 700 million years ago. We've done that in about 20 minutes. <laughs> so, but there was a few things that happened. Um, Along this time frame, also that we think we need to we need to talk about, and um, we you know we saw that slide with these these terrains that, you know gluing on to the edges of North America. You expect to have a, a number of mountain ranges, and they would you know erode through time. So why don't we see old sedimentary rocks all over the place except where they're preserved here? And there's a few, few little pockets preserved in New Mexico also. So anyhow, what, what we call this is basically we're missing 900 million years in, in, well, in the rock record in most of Colorado and worldwide. And um, so, you know, you would expect that we see these sedimentary rocks and be, you expect to see some preserved sediments uh, on the continental mass. However, there are very few places in the world where, this time where the, rock, where the rock record is preserved. So what happened? This is called the Great Unconformity. So this is this this um, photo here is from southern southern Colorado. You got this Mesoprotozoic -proto granite, which is about 1.4 billion mil, billion years old, which is the same age as the granites we see up at Eisenhower Tunnel, Pikes Peak. The, there, here's you know, on top of that is this Cambrian marine sandstone that's about uh, 500 million years old. So we're missing about 900 million years of rock. What happened to it? Hey, hey, Joe, we got a, another question for you. Okay. It says, uh, are there ever any fossils in nice outcroppings uh, form when it was at the bottom of the sea? Uh, at this point in time, life on Earth uh, in, the proto, in the Proterozoic up till about around 500 million years ago, um, the life on Earth was mainly bacteria and algae. It didn't start, but, you know, ballooning into multi-celled life forms until about five to 600 million years ago. So there are places where we see fossil bacteria and algae that are this age, but not here, because once you've metamorpho metamorphosed, you've partially melted the rock and you completely convert it from what would have been a mud stone or shale into a schist or sands and shales into gneisses. Um, so yeah, any anything that was, living in that is, is, from a fossil standpoint, is gone. It's, it's disappeared. Okay. So anyhow, why don't we see any rocks of, you know, between 1.4 to 500 million years ago? What, we, what we've recently seen in some geologic studies is that it, it appears that a period that we now we call the cryogenian, or, and it's been named snowball earth, Period between 720 to 635 million years ago, the Earth was probably completely covered or almost covered in ice and glaciers. Um, some of the some of the sediments that are preserved that we see that shows us that these are glacial deposits. We see them in Namib Namibia, there's a few in Canada, and there's some in Australia. And the ones in Namibia and Australia. We did, with paleomagnetic studies, we see that these rocks were deposited near the equator and they are glacial deposits. So we, if you have glaciers near the equator, you might have had pretty much the, all the oceans frozen, probably a few pockets of open ocean like you see in this, this diagram. We're, there are two, two major periods of glaciation during the snowball earth period. And glacials are great at scouring rocks. I mean, they do a great job eroding. So the glacial scouring most probably eroded all, 
or most of all, this Proterozoic sedimentary rocks that were, that were sitting on the, on the continent and pushed them off into the oceans. And those aren't preserved because the ocean basins expand and contract through time. And if, and if any sediments that were deposited in an ocean basin at that time, those rocks are long gone. They've been subducted into the mantle and reincorporated into uh, younger rocks. So that's why we see the great unconformity because of this cryogenian snowball earth period. So then we're going to stay, go to stop two. Okay, that was all in Officer's Gulch region where we can talk about those Proterozoic, Metamorphic, and Granitic rocks. And then starting in what we call the Paleozoic uh, era, which starts about 540 million years ago and goes up to about 250 million years ago. The Western United States or Western North America is characterized as kind of a broad, almost flat platform, pretty flat. And, um, it, and, the, and you had uh, the ocean, you know, at sea level sitting fairly high because the continent masses were fairly low in elevation. We get a lot of sediments uh, deposited in this time frame. The lower and middle Paleozoic rocks are very poorly exposed in the summit county. There's one little patch over in Mayflower Gulch of uh, some of the um, limestone um, around the, uh, that, oh, the boss mine in the Mayflower Gulch area. But there are good exposures existing along the Eagle River Canyon, uh, along Highway 24, and in the Horseshoe Gulch southwest of Alma. So these rocks consist mainly of sandstones and carbonate rocks deposited on the western platform of the North American Craton. Here, if you look, here's the great unconformity, this line here. These are the Precambrian or what we call Proterozoic gneisses. Here's the Cambrian sandstone. And above that, we have a, mainly limestones and dolomites through the lower, through the Proterozoic up to the, this ML, which is the um, Mississippian Leadville limestone. These are all carbonate rocks similar to what we would see deposited offshore Saudi Arabia today or in the Bahama Banks. Um, the, uh, the, these rocks were deposited as originally as limestones. When you get some uh, um, rainwater flowing through them, and once they're, once they're you know, subaerially exposed, um, the calcium in the limestone gets replaced by mag with magnesium and that becomes dolomite, okay? So these are the um, lower middle Paleozoic rocks of Colorado. Uh, on this next slide, it's hard to read it, but this is the sandstone, the Cambrian sandstone called the Sawwatch sandstone. You can see this right at where you turn off of Highway 24 and go into Red Cliff. Um, you can see this, that, that sandstone sitting on the uh, Proterozoic basement. And then you see the series of sandstones, limestones going up to uh, the Devonian, here's the Devonian up to the Mississippian. This is the Leadville section. Okay, so these are, uh, these are very similar throughout all of Western United States. You see these same similar rocks in all the way up through Wyoming and to Montana, um, all well, you know, eastward into Kansas um, and even into, uh, you know, Illinois, Ohio. You see these, these, carbonate, these carbonate rocks of the, of the uh, Paleozoic. And then, um, so I'm not going to spend much time talking about this stop, you know, stop two. We don't go out, when we go in the field, we don't go that all the way over to Min, uh, Minturn to, to see these rocks. We, I, we just use posters and some photographs to exhibit what they look like. And then, uh, but they are certainly present in the subsurface in sub, Summit County uh, beneath the next group of rocks we're going to talk about. So stop three, the red sandstones of the Vale Pass, Shrine Pass area. This photograph here is taken along I-70 between Vale Pass and East Vale. There's some great outcrops there. Unfortunately, there's no good place to stop to get off the highway to look at them. Um, so usually when we go out in the field, um, I take the group to Shrine Pass and go up Shrine Pass Road a couple miles. And we can actually park the cars along that dirt road, walk about 100 yards and, and get up and actually you know, see these rocks and put your hands on them and talk about them. So um, these rocks were deposited in, 
in the time frame that we call the Pennsylvanian and the Permian. This was the late part of the Paleozoic. So you've changed from this limestone, dolomite, flat formal stuff, and all of a sudden you see these all these sandstone, these sandstones being deposited. Uh, the lower part is called the Minturn Formation. It's mainly gray in color. It was deposited in water. Uh, and uh, then the upper part is called the Maroon Formation, named after the Maroon Bells. And there's these reddish to purplish red, um, reddish brown sandstones. And these were deposited mainly uh, sub, you know, by streams, but then those streams dried out. And so these rocks were sitting subaerial. They weren't in water. And hence they get uh, oxidized and turn red. So right in the Copper Mountain area, Copper, these rocks are about 7,000 feet thick. They get thicker in places and places are 14,000 feet thick. Where it's actually been, the rock, these have been measured in the field. So um, anyhow, during the Pennsylvanian, when the Minturn formation, uh, you know, the, the Colorado was near the equator. So these were deposited in humid conditions and water. And then by the time you get into the Permian, the North America had moved northward a little bit. And so you're in this kind of desertification latitudes, hence which is what we see the maroon formation. So in a good analog of the maroon formation today would be if you go out into Nevada in the basin and range country, and you see the mountain ranges and you see these big alluvial fans that are, that, you know, that, that, that are sitting on the flanks of these mountains. You know, it rains out there, but not, you know, not often. So it'd be similar to here uh, that you have a mountain range nearby, which was the, the early Gore range came up. And then, um, and then it, you know, you get a thunderstorm and it might rain five inches in a, you know, an hour, carry all these sands down into the valley and then it dries up again. And, but we can look at the, uh, the bedding of, of the maroon formation and we can see that these streams were, cut, were carrying sediments away from what is the Gore Range into a, a, a trough area. And so how did that happen? So um, there was a collision between South America, ran into North America at this time frame, resulting in a bunch of uh, uplifts and down warps on the on the crust. So we got we got uh, here. This is in Texas. This is uh, Midland, the Delaware Basin, and then this is the uh, you know Ardmore and a dark at Arcoma Basin. And this is where we are. We got an uplift here FR called Front Rangia, and then we got another one over here called Uncompagria. I'm going to take a little focus in on those. So here is the ancestral, the, we call these the ancestral Rockies. They came up at this time frame, uh, 310 to, uh, you know, about 270, 290 million years ago. So here is Front Rangia. Here's Uncompagria. This is the Paradox Basin. It's got an ocean off here, and then sea level would rise and fall, and Paradox Basin's got a lot of salt in it. We get over into, right in here, which would be around where we are, up around Vail Pass. Gore range, shedding sediments off, filling in this base, basin. So you got about 7,000 to 14,000 feet of these rocks sitting in, um, uh, in the area around Vail Pass and a little bit farther to the north of Toronto State Bridge. And then underneath that would be these carbonate rocks that we talked about earlier that, that are undoubtedly in the subsurface. Okay. And then you get some changing sea level that brings in uh, sea level into the area every now and then. You get some th thin limestones deposited. If you go up to if you go up to the top of, of the Shrine Pass hike, you get along the ridge line and walk along the ridge line. You'll see all the red sandstones as you walk through, and every, and every now and then you'll, you'll see some gray. It's one of those limestone beds that you're walking on. And the reason you get these thin limestone beds is the sea the sea level rises and then it falls. And we see these abrupt, abrupt rising and falling of sea levels in the late Paleozoic due to glaciation at the poles. And then you also, when the you get sea level come in and it goes out, you get some sea level, you get some sea water left behind and it evaporates and you get evaporites, which is halite and gypsum. And we see that over at the town of gypsum also, which is where they mine the gypsum for 
making plaster of Paris. So here's a fence diagram of what this stuff looks like. Uh, this is right at Eagle County. We call this the fence diagram. It'd be a measured section here, measured section there, measured section here, and then they kind of put them all together. So the lower part is the Minturn. Here's this eagle evaporite, and the upper part would be the um, um, maroon formation. And the, and, the, and the dividing line between them is just arbitrary because there's no change in deposition. It just went from humid conditions to more arid. And they pick one of these limestone beds as the marker that says, okay, below that is, is the Minturn formation, above that is the Moon formation. So this was, this was the formation of the ancestral Rockies at a time around 300 million years ago. Okay, so in the, in the Permian, um, we have a formation of another one of these supercontinents. Um, but this one was called Pangaea. And here is uh, North America. This is South America, Africa. All could, this, was, this mass was called Gondwana. This, is, this was North America, Europe, you know, Siberia. And um, so they form, collided and formed the supercontinent. The, the suturing zone between the, it's called the Central Pangean Mountains. And actually, in fact, if you look at that, that's the Ap Wachita Mountains in um, Arkansas, the Appalachian Mountains in the eastern part of the US and, and North America. And then you get over to uh, Scotland and Greenland, they're called the Caledonian Mountains. They're all formed at the same time during, the, during this collisional event. And then something else also happened at, near, the end, near the end of the Permian. Um, this was first described back when we were looking at these rocks. Um, the Permian is from the area of Perm in Russia in the Ural Mountains. This is where these rocks were first described back in the 1800s. And then just right after the, the, this Permian period, there was a major change in the flora and fauna on Earth. So what happens at the end of the Permian, at 250 million, 1 million years ago, right here at the end of the Permian, 90 to 95% of the life on Earth became extinct. The major extinction event. There were some other minor ones during the Paleozoic, uh, but this was a whopper. Um, you know, just wiped, almost wiped out everything. And, and that, was, that was what the early geologists defined as the end of the Paleozoic and the start of the Mesozoic um, uh, eras. And for a long time, we had no idea. Just, we just knew that it happened. But the recent work uh, shown that the Siberian traps, are, which are, which are a major volcanic event, occurred at this time in, um, in, in Siberia. And these volcanoes erupted through thick, thick beds of coal. So you ended up with these volcanoes coming through coal, burning the coal up, putting sulfur emissions in the air, a, uh, a lot of nitrous and fluorine, fluorine in the air, a lot of CO2, so you end up with um, volcanic darkness, acid rain, and then followed by some, a lot of CO2 and global warming. But this, this basically wipes out land, you know, the terrestrial fauna and flora because you had acid rain, darkening the skies, changing climate, and, you know, animals and plants killed off. And then in the, in the ocean, you acidified the ocean and you had a, a major marine extension. So that, that takes us to the end of the Permian. So anyhow, that's kind of where we wanted to go today with this discussion. Um, um, I think it's the last, just the last slide. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, the um, that's what we usually do when we go out in the field. We spend the, probably the first hour to hour and a half in the field talking about this. It's been a little bit shorter today because usually in the field we have, I've got about. 10 posters, we've got geologic maps we put up on the wall. We're actually, actually looking at the rocks hands-on, talking about the minerals in the, in the Proterozoic gneisses. We can actually go look at the, uh, the, the bedding in the, in the uh, maroon formation. You can see which way the streams were flowing uh, away from the gore, the early you know, uplift of the gore range called front range yet. And I think what we were, not, we're thinking about doing uh, and talking with Cam is that, um, We'll, we'll follow this up with a, with a couple other discussions uh, that we would have 
like when we would go on the, out the rocks, you know, look at the rocks in the field and talk about uh, the Mesozoic, what was going on in the Mesozoic and the, um, the formation of the Cretaceous Seaway that split the North American continent into, and then follow that with the formation of the Laramide Uplift, which formed the Rocky Mountains, the mineralization that forms the Colorado Mineral Belt, and what was going on there. And then the you know the late the late events that set up the um, um, Blue River Valley, and then the latest event, which was the glaciation in the Pleistocene that cut the landforms as we see them today. So I think this is what we'll do in future ones. So if there's anybody, if there's any question, any more questions, we've got plenty of time. Uh, to, yeah, you know, Joe, we had uh, one more from Walt Spring who. Hey, uh, you you mute, you just muted yourself. I couldn't hear you. <laughs> Sorry okay. about that. Had uh, one more question from Walt, um, from okay. Walt Spring, and mm -hmm. he was wondering what kind of life was around at the extinction. There were there were um, there there were terrestrial animals that were walking around. They're big. They weren't you know they weren't rep, they were weren't reptile. They weren't dinosaurs yet, but they were you know, they were they were animals. And there were a lot of there were a lot of uh, trees. Uh, kind of big fern trees in the late Paleozoic. Um, the ocean life was abundant. Uh, there was a lot of um, um, uh, uh, shelly type animals on the seafloor. Um, there were the um, uh, 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 ammonites and nautiloid type things that were floating around. Um, but you know, very you know, just a few hardy ones made it through, and that's the that's what. The, you know, the few hardy terrestrial animals that made it through, you know, gave rise to the uh, proto dinosaurs and the dinosaurs that came in to the, the Triassic and the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. And then we got started getting flowering plants and that sort of thing uh, generated and uh, more deciduous type trees came in. Um, but, uh, you yeah, know, there was plenty of life on earth. It was just totally different. You know, there's there's places where, uh, it's mainly in South Africa and um, uh, in, in the Urals uh, in Russia, where these fossils have been, you know, described and their people have spent their lives working with them. But, you know, there, there's a pretty good sized fauna and flora that was on the planet at that time. There, there was no lack of, you know, life, a lot of bony fishes in the ocean that, you know, didn't make it through this, this period. So, uh, it was, you know, it was, I would say Earth was teeming with life uh, up until that disastrous event. And then it took a few million years before it started coming back. One thing we see at the, at the Permian-Triassic boundary, almost everywhere worldwide, not so much, you know, there's, we see this boundary in, 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 um, in the Rocky Mountains, not too far from between uh, Vail and Aspen, north of the Interstate 70, where you, you see these Triassic red beds because you know it's still very dry climate at that point, you know. And but what we see, the first thing we see is usually a big bed of conglomerates, big bouldery rocks, because when you kill off all the plant life, it's still raining. It's got but it's acid rain. It's still raining, but there's no nothing to hold the soil in place. So all the soil just kind of got ripped off the. And the first the first thing we see on top of the Permian sediments is this Triassic boulder bed. Okay. Anything else, Cam? Yeah. Um, we've got a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. We have one. It's asking, are there any good books that uh, that cover the geology of the Rockies um, as well as the things that you're discussing? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, there's a couple. Um, I, I can't remember the names of them off, offhand um, uh, because they're all back in my library in Colorado and I'm stuck here in Ohio right now. Uh, but there is a um, there's a book that's published by the Colorado Geological Survey. You just go on their website and hit click bookstore. It, it redirects you to the bookstore, which is the Colorado Geological Survey bookstore is actually at the School of Mines in, in Golden. There's a book that's called um, I don't remember something Stories in Stone or you know um, it's it kind of a pictorial ge geology of Colorado. It was written by a former state geologist, Vince Matthews. It's got a lot of really nice photographs in it, and um, and you know, and maps and stuff. 
There's a couple other books. If you just go Colorado Geology, probably on Amazon, there's a couple other books that were written by, one was written by a professor at, at Metro State. Uh, it's pretty good. Another one by a guy that was that taught out at um, uh, Western Colorado College. I don't remember the college. Um, uh, um, they're pretty good. And there's also a, the, the um, uh, Color, Colorado Geological Survey publishes a map they call tourist geology map of the state. And it's, it's uh, not real, it's not as detailed as one of these geologic maps that I pull out. But it, it, if you're driving around, you, you can figure out, you know, what you're looking at pretty easily. And it's got great descriptions in on this, on this map about what the rocks are. And, and there's a few other things that there's some posters that they, that they put out. But there are, there are about three, I would say general, general books that are pretty good. They don't go into a lot of detail, but you know, are good for if you just want to drive around and kind of see what you're what you're you know what you're walk, hiking on or driving driving through that are good. And there's also another one that's good is um, these western all these western states have these books called Roadside Geology of Colorado, Utah. The one in Colorado is, is good. It's I think it's in a it's in a second edition now. The original author passed away and somebody else kind of took up the mantle to to update it. And they've got uh, the uh, second edition's got color photos to the black and white, and it, it's carried at the FDRD um, store. I've seen it also at the uh, Next Page Bookstore in Frisco, so you'll be able to find that. Um, of course, you probably get it on Amazon too. That's Roadside Geology of Colorado. Okay. All right, all right, uh, Joe. We got one more here from Jamie Morris. Says okay. I jumped on a little late. Sorry if this is not applicable. But uh, here in Indiana, we have a huge exposed fossil bed from the Devonian period. Yes. Uh, says, I think I have that right. Clarksville, yep. Indiana, right on the Ohio River. And the question is, does that stretch all the way to your neck of the woods? Basically, yes. <laughs> With a few minor exceptions, but basically, yeah. It, the rocks we see um, from about, um, I would say, central Ohio westward, we're all on this broad platform of, uh, of on the edge of the continent, the continent was pretty flat. There may be a few little hills here and there, a few little low spots. Some of the low spots wouldn't have the limestone in; they had maybe a black, black mudstone shale. But the but the, that Devonian limestone is present in Ohio. It's present all through Indiana, Illinois, out through Kansas, and all the way to the uh, uh, the old continental margin, which is now sitting in central Utah. Very cool. I think that that is, uh, that's all the questions we've got on here. We're good. I uh, want to give a huge, huge thank you to Joe Newhart for stepping up and doing the first educational webinar in our series. We hope to continue doing this in weeks to come. Um, the next one is going to be next Tuesday, June 2nd. Uh, Dan Schroeder, um, he works for CSU Extension. Mm -hmm. He will be giving a presentation titled, Our Clear Cuts the Answer. Um, kind of talking about whether, you know, save what's more important, kind of saving the national forest or this urban interface that we're all living in here. Um, but yeah, again, I want to thank everyone for, for tuning in to this. Um, as I said at the beginning, our volunteers are what make this organization so special. And it's, it's difficult for us as staff to not be here uh, or not be with all the volunteers, but we're really thankful that we're able to reach out to you guys in some way. And I hope that this um, was a very uh, impactful and educational webinar for you guys. So a huge thanks again to Joe Newhart for this. And uh, thanks. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. And we'll, we'll, uh, uh, we'll see you next time. The last thing is um, yeah. the, the slides that I used in the PowerPoint presentation. Uh, Cam has a PDF version of them and, and a PowerPoint version if anybody wants to you want to download them and print them off yourself i think you, you get to them through the fdr website FDR yep. so i will uh i'll post those on on the uh on our website on the calendar page under okay. in our like the description on the calendar um yeah. you can also email me cam at fdrd.org if you've got any further questions about this or any ways that we can improve this um yeah, I'll be posting this 
Um, this will be posted to our Facebook and I recorded it on Zoom. So it will also be posted to YouTube if you wanna share it with any friends or family that were, weren't able to attend this. So uh, this is a really awesome thing and we're hoping to, to reach more people than we would have just through our hike series. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I saw that there are some people tuned in from Indiana, which is just awesome. So <laughs> yeah. we're real excited about it. And uh, thanks again, Joe. And we'll see you all. Got, we'll see you all at the next one. Very good. Take care, everyone. <laughs> all right.